Hello, and welcome to this presentation of the Jane Austen's Playlist, Music in Jane Austen's Life and Literature, hosted by Virtual JaneCon 2024. My name is Laura Klein, and I am the founder and creator of the Jane Austen Playlist, a project that researches, digitizes, and records the music in the Austen family music books. Additionally, this project pairs the writings of Jane Austen with the music from her personal collection in a musically driven, dramatized performance. Today, I will be sharing with you a multifaceted history of Jane Austen as pianist, and the piano is an integral theme to Jane Austen's writing. I would like to extend, first of all, my deepest appreciation to Virtual Jane Con for the invitation to present this program, and to you as my audience members for being here with me today. It is a truth universally acknowledged that an accomplished woman in possession of a good musical skill must be in want of musical repertoire. This manifestation of accomplishment is exemplified across Jane Austen's literary works, and it is through an intimate knowledge of the social and musical world in which she lived that gave her mastery of the subject. Jane Austen, one of England's leading novelists, is read, studied, and revered around the world. Over 30 million copies of her novels have been sold. Translated into 35 different languages, they have inspired countless film adaptations, biographies, documentaries, and reimaginings. It is little known, however, in addition to Austen's keen writing ability, she was a skilled pianist. Austen played from a young age and remained dedicated to practice until her death. She took lessons through much of her childhood and young adult life. Thus, in addition to the music collected and played by other Austin women, this gave her access to much of the music a la mode being printed and performed in London. Throughout most of her life, she had an instrument either by possession or through hire. Additionally, her brother Edward Austin Knight maintained a variety of pianofortes at his Chawton and Godmersham estates that were at her disposal when she visited. The knowledge that Jane acquired of procuring instruments and of the music that she played throughout her lifetime is depicted across diverse social constructs in her novels. From the colorful village of Highbury, 16 miles outside of London, to Barton Cottage on the remote coast of Devon. She applies varying levels of musical accomplishment to the females on display, from the extremely accomplished Mary Crawford and Georgiana Darcy, to the inept Catherine Moreland and Lady Catherine de Bourgh, despite the latter's declaration that she would have been a great proficient had she ever learned. Austen's famous protagonists, Emma Woodhouse and Elizabeth Bennet, fall somewhere in between with their somewhat adequate proficiency, as they admittedly would not take the trouble of practicing. Regardless of the level of skill bestowed upon her novel's characters, Jane herself was a committed pianist, evident both through her letters and her recorded musical habits. In the process of tracing her involvement with the instrument and the music she practiced, several topics of intrigue arise. What types of pianofortes would Jane have played throughout her lifetime? What was the music she was practicing in her years of lessons, both when she was developing her writing and finally when her novels were being published in the later part of her life? And what are the implications of her music on her literary output? Let's begin with the piano. In 1700, an inventory of instruments at the Florentine court of Grand Prince Ferdinando de Medici lists an arpicimbalo, an instrument newly invented by Bartolomeo Cristofori, resembling a harpsichord that included dampers, hammers, two keyboards, and a range of four octaves. This first pianoforte, named for its ability to make loud and soft sounds, quickly became a prototype for the succeeding keyboard instruments. By the time Jane Austen was born 75 years later, instrument makers in London were producing pianofortes in the thousands. The grand pianoforte, as seen on the left side of the screen, was like the harpsichord in shape and exterior design, a prototype for the modern concert grand. 
The sound was richer and fuller in tone than any keyboard instrument yet constructed, allowing for contrast in articulation and dynamics. This in turn brought it into increasing popularity during the 18th century. However, not unlike the modern grands of the 20th and 21st centuries, they required a rather large footprint, perfect for the music rooms of the gentry, but much too large for the drawing rooms of the middle class in which the instrument played a central role. Enter the square piano, a design that emerged in England in the 1760s by a German immigrant named Johann Zumpe. Rectangular in shape, as you'll see in the right side of the screen, the square piano quickly developed in quality and popularity over the next several decades, as it was small enough to accommodate moderately sized drawing rooms while still providing the appearance of gentility and accomplishment for young ladies. While Austin would have had access to the pianoforte grands housed on her brother's numerous estates throughout the south of England, the instruments that Austin herself rented or owned throughout her lifetime were square pianos. The family piano, her primary instrument for practice during the first 25 years of her life, had to be sold upon the family's move to Bath in 1801, much to her dismay. After the necessity of renting an instrument for the next several years, she enthuses in a letter to her sister Cassandra in anticipation of their move to Chawton Cottage in 1809 that yes, yes, we will have a pianoforte, as good a one as can be got for 30 guineas, and I will practice country dances that we may have some amusement for our nephews and nieces when we have the pleasure of their company. This was taken from a letter written the 27th through 28th of December, 1808. Her niece, Caroline, notably recalls in My Aunt Jane, a memoir, that Austin began her day with music, regularly practicing each morning, even before breakfast or picking up her pen to write. Much scholarship has been dedicated to the function of the piano as a societal focus during the Regency era, as well as the level of accomplishment it presented this is demonstrated often in Jane's writings. Her characters are frequently seated at the instrument in a variety of settings, revealing the significance it carried in differing social settings as a representation of accomplishment, gentility, luxury, and class. In Austen's first published novel, Sense and Sensibility, the pianoforte is a central figure as a frequent outlet for Marianne's despair. It plays a subtler role in Pride and Prejudice and Emma, yet still serves as a frequent focus for conversation, accomplishment, and intrigue. In Mansfield Park in Northanger Abbey, it is hardly mentioned, whereas in Persuasion, Austen's final and most mature novel, it is a seat of retreat and introspection for its main character, Anne Elliot. Regardless of her role assignation of the instrument, it is revealed as a source of pleasure and agony, arrogance and embarrassment, attraction and annoyance. But what of the music? What was Austen playing and how does this impact her writing? The Austen Family Music Books, a compilation of music spanning nearly 80 years, was collected by the female members of the Austen family. While many belong to her brother's wives, a total of seven books bear Jane Austen's signature in the front flyleaf, and an eighth scrapbook includes her handwriting. As she was often in close quarters with the other volume's owners, she also had access to additional scores. Some of the printed music in these volumes are duplicated by hand in Austen's personal manuscripts, sure proof of frequent perusal through her sister's in law's scores. Through careful preservation, the manuscripts Caroline Austin recollects in this quote are still in existence today. And they are indeed copied so neatly and correctly that they are much easier to, to read than many of the other manuscripts in the collection. Extraordinarily, the quality of her music copying was criticized by her sister-in-law, Elizabeth Knight. In a letter to Cassandra, written on the 8th of January, 1799, Austin acidly remarks that, quote, Elizabeth is very cruel about my writing music, and as a punishment for her, I should insist upon always writing out all hers for her in the future, if I were not punishing myself at the same time." End quote. Frozen in time, not unlike a work of art, they represent hours and hours of careful copying and practicing. 
More significantly, they provide a thorough view into Austin's personal taste for music and the impact that this music had on her writing. With a few pertinent exceptions, I will focus today primarily on the piano works in two of Austin's volumes. The first, copied entirely in Austin's handwriting, is on location at Jane Austen's house in Chawton, Hampshire. These are the two pictures on the left of the screen. The second, the first volume of Corey's select collection of choice music for the harpsichord or pianoforte, was recently rediscovered on the bookshelf of a distant relative after missing for over 50 years. It was gifted to Chawton House, the large estate to which Jane Austen's house originally belonged as a caretaker's cottage. And these are depicted on the two pictures in the right of the screen. Both volumes contain sonatas, concertos, marches, overtures, dances, duets, and variations on Scottish and Irish airs for both solo and accompanied pianoforte. The repertoire throughout these volumes is a mixture of works appearing in printed publications between circa 1775 and 1810 by composers still very much recognized today, such as Haydn, Handel, and Mozart, as well as names that have been virtually forgotten, such as Mzingi, Kielmark, and Corey. Austen's music collection was well underway when she wrote her juvenilia works and was virtually complete by the time of her first novel's publication in 1811. She does not specify titles in her music scenes with exception to one scene, which we will examine later. One of the most prominent mentions of music in her novel Social Gatherings are Irish and Scotch airs. Examples of such scenes are in Pride and Prejudice, where Mary is finally convinced to play something other than a long concerto, and in Emma, where Emma and Frank Churchill speculate over the anonymous benefactor of a pianoforte and sheet music given to Jane Fairfax. The vocal forms were typically popular poems set to folk tunes of Scottish or Irish origins. The manuscripts contain a variety of these, as well as arrangements for keyboard, such as theme and variation sets, themes for sonata movements, or lessons for the harpsichord or pianoforte. Here on the screen, we have a few examples in her handwriting, and these are all taken from the manuscript of keyboard music copied in her own hand between the years of 1790 and 1810. On the top left, we have a simple arrangement of a Scotch air. On the bottom left, variations on My Love, She's But a Lassie Yet by Thomas Powell. And then on the right hand side, we have the primo and secondo parts for the duet, My Lodging is on the Cold Ground which is also a theme and variation set.
In Corey's newly rediscovered volume of pianoforte and harpsichord music, a variety of Irish and Scottish melodies are also represented. As you can see on the screen, we have four different collections, Butler's Miscellaneous Lesson with Scotch Tunes, Loch Eric Side, which is a duet arranged by Corey, three sonatas by Corey that incorporate Scottish tunes, and then an Irish air made into a rondo, also arranged by Corey. And here I will perform one of the themes that shows up in his Sonata Opus 5, number three, which is Where Ha Ye Been A Day, Bonnie Laddie.
As I mentioned before, Austen doesn't name specific pieces in her novel writing, with exception to one instance. In the conversation previously mentioned between Emma and Frank Churchill, Churchill brings Emma's attention to the piece that Jane Fairfax is playing, Robin Adair. A song of Irish origins, it was a favorite melody in the 18th century, and it not only shows up in Austen's novel, but also in her music. One of the music volumes Austen shared with her sister Cassandra contains a set of theme and variations based on Robin Adair, arranged by George Kielmark. It was printed in 1812 in London and was being played by Austen when she began writing Emma on January 21, 1814.
Another genre contained in both Austin's music collection and in her writing is that of the keyboard concerto. The novel reference that immediately comes to mind is in Pride and Prejudice, where Mary Bennett tediously plays a long concerto to exhibit her proficiency at the piano. Yet this reference raises the question of how she is performing a concerto alone, a work that is meant to be performed with a group of instruments. In the 18th century, keyboard concerti were often arranged to incorporate the accompaniment parts to allow for solo playing. As such, there are numerous keyboard concerti throughout the volumes in Austin's collection. The Cori volume alone contains four concerti titled with accompaniments by Kutzeluk, Shetki, Corelli, and Djanovic, all adapted by Cori to include the accompaniments within the keyboard part. Four other volumes belonging to Austin, including the volumes she inherited from her first teacher, Anne Colley, contain concerti. Like the previously displayed works in the Cori volume, none of these include any instrumental parts save the last one, which includes parts for two violins, viola, and cello. However, the keyboard part still incorporates the other instrumental parts for ease of solo playing. As such, any of these would be candidates for Mary's long concerto at Lucas Lodge. And here is the first movement of the favorite concerto that is included in Corey's volume by Kutzluk. <laughs>
One of the common ways music is inferred through Austen's novels is in numerous dance scenes. A favored form of entertainment in the Regency era, dancing took place publicly at assemblies, formal balls, or in the privacy of hosts or family's drawing rooms. At an assembly, music was provided by a small group of local musicians, or at times, even a lone fiddler, whereas a chamber orchestra would be secured for more formal balls. In the drawing rooms, music was performed by a young lady on a keyboard instrument while the rest of the party danced. This is established with Mary's playing for impromptu dancing at Lucas Lodge in Pride and Prejudice and Anne Elliott offering her services at the keyboard for dancing at the Musgroves in Persuasion. While Jane wouldn't have played for public dancing, she would have taken her turn at the piano forte for impromptu dances in the homes of her friends and family. The presence of dances in her handwritten music collection, as well as in her letter to her sister Cassandra, suggests preparatory practice for such an occasion. The Strathsby, a country dance originating in Scotland, had made its way to England by the 18th century. The Strathsby that Jane copied into her manuscript was a new pianoforte arrangement of a fiddle reel composed by Nathaniel Gow, and it's titled Mrs. Hamilton of Pincatlin's Strathsby. waltzes, four merely titled Waltz, or German Waltz, and one titled the Gloucestershire Waltz. Waltzes were new to English repertory, their scores only beginning to appear in English dance publications around 1790. The dance was still of questionable morality when Austen was writing her juvenilia and first drafts in the 1790s. It was more accepted by the time of her 19th century Pride and Prejudice. A few of the dances are as yet unidentifiable. One has been identified as the extracted trio from Mozart's German Dance No. 3, which was a popular trend of the day to extract trios from previously written works. This waltz was composed by Lady Caroline Lee, but not much else is known about it. was highly popular from the time of its inception in England's 18th century society.
hidden surprises in Austin's manuscripts, including themes borrowed, renamed, and reworked into something completely different from their original material. This particular find led to my residency at Jane Austen's house in a fun way. Let me explain. British militia and Navy played an important role in Austen's life, as four of her brothers served and her father, Reverend George Austen, actively recruited for the local militia. Additionally, her sister's fiancé, Tom Fowle, died of yellow fever while on a military expedition to the West Indies. Thus, it is no surprise that military-themed tunes are plentiful in Austen's manuscripts. Most of the tunes are distant enough to be difficult to place. However, one is surprisingly familiar if you're familiar with Mozart's work at all. When I performed for Jane Austen's house in a virtual recital during COVID, I included this tune with the joke that Pride and Prejudice Militia's crazed character, Lydia Bennett, would particularly approve of its reworking into a military theme. When Patrick Piggott wrote The Innocent Diversion, Music in the Life and Writings of Jane Austen in 1979, the Austen Family Music Books collection included Corey's volume. It was discovered missing in the early 1980s, much to the dismay of Austen scholar Deirdre Le Fay. Fast forward to the summer of 2023, just a week prior to my performance trip to Chawton, and my Facebook feed was filled with the astonishing news that the volume had been discovered and restored to the Chawton collection. I immediately contacted Emma Yandel, the collection's curator at Chawton House, with whom I became acquainted on a previous research trip, and she invited me to Chawton to explore and play from the book at the house. I was granted extensive photography rights and hours at the 1828 Stoddard Grand on location, playing through the 150 plus pages of this delightful volume. In the picture on the top right of the screen, you'll see Jane Austen's signature, which is in the flyleaf. And then in the picture on the left, which you'll also see in the video in just a moment, is the Stoddard Grand that I had the opportunity to play. The biggest curiosity about the Cory volume is the presence of one lone handwritten page. The speculation is that the page was printed incorrectly and had to be recopied in order to be playable. But by whom? There are two other copies in the UK of this volume, one at the University of Leeds Library and one at the University of Edinburgh Library. Both have properly printed pages. The copy belonging, belonging to Austin's piano teacher, Dr. George Chard, who served as organist for Winchester Cathedral, has been recently traced as sold, but has yet to be examined. These findings are vital for verifying whether or not this is Austin's handwriting, but when the writing is meticulously compared to Austin's other scores, there is not much doubt. It is my hope that we will soon be able to confirm that it is indeed Austin's handwriting. The picture on the left of the screen is from Corey's volume, and the two excerpts on the middle and the right of the screen are other examples of her writing. While one of the pages in this piece is handwritten, the rest of them are printed, as you can see on the slide. This is a miscellaneous lesson, which is the first movement by Maldair, which was arranged for the harpsichord by Domenico Corey. Thank you. 
Jane Austen has left a legacy through her countless written words of genius and wit and her literary output. This influence continues to create an impact on authors, literary scholars, and educators, and aspiring writers the world over. In addition to scholarly works, her writings have influenced vast amounts of reimagined novels, Jane Austen fan fiction, and film adaptations. As for her musical impact, little has been done. Some film scores have been influenced by the Austen music, and in recent years, more light has been shed on the collection in recordings. However, much remains to be done. As a respected pianist, lifelong Jane Austen scholar, resident pianist of Jane Austen's house, and a doctoral candidate studying performance practice musicology with focused research on the Austin Family Music Book Collection, it is my goal and privilege to continue developing this project in a diversity of ways. If you're interested in finding out more about the Jane Austen playlist, I would love to hear from you. Please feel free to either send me an email or to subscribe via social media, which is my handle is the Jane Austen playlist. I'm also on YouTube. And then my email is also on the screen if you'd like to find out more specifics about the project. In the meantime, thank you for joining me today in the exploration of the music that Jane Austen played and loved. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Virtual Jane Con. See you soon.